Hey, I'm Mike Gilliam, and welcome to Let It Rip. We're coming to you from the CUNY TV studios in the shadow of the Empire State Building in New York City. The war in Ukraine is dominating the headlines here and around the world, with images of death and destruction beamed across our screens and newspapers. Without a doubt, Vladimir Putin is wrong for launching an unprovoked attack on a sovereign democratic nation. One aspect of the tragedy is the refugee crisis created by the invasion. More than two and a half million people have already been displaced and are fleeing the war-torn country. And with a population of more than 44 million people, many more are expected to follow. It's a humanitarian crisis, and the displaced may eventually become immigrants to other countries. Now, to add to the tragedy, there are reports that African and other minority students trying to get out of Ukraine are encountering racism at the borders and being forcibly removed from trains or prevented from getting in lines to leave in favor of white Ukrainians. Some have said the reports are just Russian propaganda aimed at discrediting the Ukrainians. But there appears to be a lot more to the story. Here to help us sort it out, we have two guests, human rights attorney Kiru Gachuro, and from the African Empowerment Project of New York City, Abdul Rahman Diallo. Kiru, let's start with you. Sure. Um, the UN is now saying that yes, this is true. Ukrainians and non-Ukrainians are being treated differently at the Poland border. Does that surprise you at all? No, not at all, because if you look at the history of Ukraine, you'll actually find that black folks who moved to Ukraine have been experiencing discrimination for a very long time, uh, whether in housing or whether they're just walking down the street and then all of a sudden confronted by police officers who may rely on certain stereotypes that black folks are, are notorious for trafficking drugs. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, and even when you talk about Poland, Poland has a long history of being very xenophobic. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't mean that even as you have those black students who are going to cross over to, to Poland, that that somehow is going to mean that they're going to be in a safe haven. It might be temporary, but we know the far right, um, or rather the extreme right in Poland, is going to t do something and speak out against having black folks in that particular country. Yeah, I had read a couple of articles that said that uh, the Polish people were uh, very much against any immigration, really. They were just very tough on that. Right. right? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, if you go back and look at what happened in Syria, um, there was a lot of pushback in terms of having uh, Syrian refugees come and settle in Poland. So none of this is surprising, which is why I was, I was actually surprised that the African Union sent out a very anemic statement saying that it was shocking in terms of what, how black folks were being treated as they attempted to cross a border from Ukraine into Poland. Uh -huh. Diallo, were you surprised by this? Uh, not at all. Uh, as he mentioned, um, there's a many history in Eastern Europe and uh, about you know racial discrimination, and you know last year I was in Europe for five months. I myself was traveling around and, and you know experienced some of those discriminations. And but what really shocked me is that these are not illegal immigrants. Actually, these are students mm -hmm. who flew to this country and paying their money, paying good money, and good money, and you know participating economically to Ukraine. Ukraine is not a United States, it's not a Canada, it's not an England where people will die to come. Ukraine is, is, is not a big emerging country. So these African students went there uh, to, for, to study. And obviously there's a crisis, everybody trying to be on the safe side, and uh, the authority, the Ukrainian authority, preventing them from leaving, mm -hmm. and that's what's happening. Briefly, you said that um, you had experienced some of this stuff yourself. Give me just an example. So, for example, I was in Italy uh, lately. Um, you know, I've seen discrimination on the bus mm -hmm. uh, because it's black, and so and many other stuff on the restaurants. Um, so, I've seen how the Africans, people, especially the African black, black African, how they live in in Europe. So, this was in. Um, a surprise and right now we are working with several African students in Ukraine as of we speak right now and trying to help them to move. Uh, you know, um, the good thing is uh, for the past few days uh, things have getting better because everybody have been speaking up um, but there will be a lot of problems as you mentioned people crossing to Poland. Poland we know the far right of Poland will be even more problematic than the Ukraine itself. Mm -hmm. Kiru, um this is uh, being downplayed by some saying, oh, no, come on, that's just Russian propaganda and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not buying that. Um, how do you fix the problem, though? Can the U.N. 
take care of this or does this have to be more of a global effort? How do you, how do you fix this? Well, I think it's more of a global effort because anti-blackness is not something that's restricted just to Russia or, uh, or, the, or Ukraine. Um, mm -hmm. As uh, Mr. Diallo mentioned, it's across, it's across Europe. Um, but I'd also like to see the African Union play a more active role and, and be a little bit more intentional about calling out discrimination. Um, but that's going to take a lot of the um, African countries actually pulling together because even when you look at the sort of evacuation of certain African students, Nigeria had its own evacuation plan, Ghana had its own evacuation plan. So rather than doing it as a global, um, glo uh, rather an African um, evacuation plan, where you're saying these are African students, we are going to get them out, irrespective of what nationality they are. Uh, you also have some of the Caribbean students who are experiencing the same thing. Uh, it would be great to see CARICOM also take a more active role and, and be more firm in calling out racism and doing much, much more to make sure that all the Caribbean students were, were removed. Um, the UNHCR has, has said that, hey, this is something that is a problem. But again, you don't see the sort of... Um, robust engagement in, in trying to make sure that all those students are being removed safely and that wherever they end up, it's going to be a safe environment for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just kind of throwing this out there, is there anything that the U.S. government can do to make sure that this is opened up, whether it be cutting aid or something like that? Are there avenues? Uh, well, that's a little bit more problematic because, you, as you know, uh, the United States has also had its own issues uh, with racism. So it's not clear how, you know, how actively they're going to engage, uh, particularly with the fact that they kind of tend to look at Ukraine from a more global standpoint and they're not pinpointing and saying, hey, you have uh, racism across the border. How then do we make sure we can get these African students out? But I think if they um, are intentional about it and saying, hey, we need to have a more robust response to making sure that not just Africans, but also um, Europe uh, Ukrainians who are leaving um, Ukraine can do so. Um, but I think it's going to be a little bit more challenging for, for the United States, given its domestic policy and history of racism. Yeah, yeah. Um, we mentioned the fact that globally um, this, this can be a problem. Right. And in reality, when you kind of broaden out and get into like immigration and right. discuss that, what you see are that, you know, immigrants of color have been treated differently, even in this country, uh, for many, many years. Right. I think of the Haitian refugees. Yes. Um, I think of like the things that um, were said about Mexican right. immigrants and all of that. Yes. Uh, talk to me <laughs> about that a little bit. Well, I mean, and, and, I, and I think you, you, you underscore my point in terms of noting that um, any time you have black or brown uh, refugees, they're treated very differently. They're looked upon as, one, emerging from, or rather fleeing countries that have a history of either civil strife or political um, situations that make it very difficult for folks to experience the sort of security that uh, a nation state should actually provide its own citizens. Um, and so I think when you come to the United States, it doesn't even necessarily mean that if you do cross the border and you get here, whether it's political asylum and you're offered temporary protected status, that you're going to now be protected from the sort of racism that, uh, that folks here have already been experiencing for a very long time. Um, so I think it's going to be a challenge moving forward. Um, I am not very confident in the United States at this time. I think it's domestic po uh, politics have continued to shape um, the response to international strife, particularly when it comes to black and brown folks, that I think will make it very difficult to actually have a cogent policy that will allow them to receive people with open arms in the same way that Ukrainians have been received across Europe with very welcoming arms, something that African students did not receive. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, a lot of this has to do also with tone, tone that is set at the top. And we right. had a very nasty tone concerning uh, immigrants yes. you know, during the last administration. Right. From where you sit, Diallo, how, how do you see that? Do you pick up that tone? I think the tone is problematic, but I think there is a deeper than the tone. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at it, there's, as he mentioned, there's an anti-blackness. Um, if you look at 2011, when um, you know uh, Libya was invited and uh, President Gaddafi was killed, mm -hmm. um, you know there was slavery in broad daylight in Libya. Black men were sold and bought in the broad daylight, and that was in Africa. Um, if you look at in 2020 in China, uh, while everybody was you know in depressed with the virus, the pandemic, while we all was here condemning the attack on Chinese American. And the China authority was beating black students 
and then dragging them out of their dorm and putting them into um, you know, government facility, preventing them from food. Mm -hmm. And fast forward 2022, you have the Ukrainian crisis, and now everybody is you know, standing in solidarity with the Ukrainian people, and the Ukrainian authority is doing the same discrimination to the black people. So as an African, uh, especially as a black African, we need to ask ourselves, uh, what are we doing to prevent this kind of stuff? Or are we just gonna stay um, stay calm and deal with it as it comes. And we really need to ask ourselves as African. Because this discrimination, it's not just the tone, it's not just outside Africa, it's also inside Africa. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of a ticklish situation because in reality, we want to stand in solidarity with the Ukrainians because this is a horrible thing that's happening, this war. Correct. But at the same time, you want equal treatment here for people who are trying to flee that same war, right? Correct. We can denounce both bad, right? We can denounce the Russian uh, you know, invasion of Ukraine. At the same time, if there's a discrimination, we should denounce it. Um, I think we see in the mass media right now and many other politicians, um, you know, thinking if they denounce this uh, discrimination, um, they are playing with uh, Russia, quote unquote, propaganda. Mm -hmm. But uh, we can denounce this discrimination. At the same time, we can be in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Yeah, it's, it's a, a strange thing because like, if you talk about this discrimination that is going on, you're somehow not, not caring enough about the war, right. but in reality, these are people's lives as well, right? right? No, you're absolutely right, and I think uh, Mr. Diallo you know, hit it on the, on the head. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to have a both-end uh, approach to this. On the one hand, we can acknowledge that uh, Russia's invasion is wrong, and it's leading to the displacement of um, a ton of lives. Uh, but we can also call out racism and ask the president, what exactly are you going to do? And I think they, you know, in terms of the uproar that happened, you saw the Ukrainian uh, foreign uh, prime minister, I mean, foreign minister or foreign affairs minister who went ahead and said that they have set up a particular hotline to make sure that students and whoever else is experiencing discrimination to call in and see whether they're experiencing any problems and to go ahead and, um, you know, have the call, you know, call in mm -hmm. and have that issue addressed. So it's going to be interesting to see how things are going forward. But I don't think we should shy away from criticizing them and letting them know that um, racism is wrong and that they shouldn't discriminate against black folks. Okay, good conversation. That's gonna have to do it for now, but expect to hear much more on this issue in the future. I wanna thank our guests, human rights attorney, Kiru Gachuru, and from the African Empowerment Project of New York City, Abdul Rahman Diallo. Thanks for joining us. President Joe Biden makes good on a campaign promise and nominates the first black woman to the Supreme Court. We'll discuss the historical pick in just a moment. I'm Mike Gilliam, and this is Let It Rip. You're watching CUNY TV, the City University of New York. I'm Mike Gilliam, and welcome back to Let It Rip. If and when Ketanji Brown Jackson is confirmed to the Supreme Court, it'll be cause for celebration. She was expected to be easily confirmed, as she was to her current position as a federal judge on the United States Court of Appeals for D.C., where she served since 2021. And her confirmation will not change the ideological makeup of the court, as she would replace retiring Justice Stephen Breyer on the conservative-dominated bench. But that hasn't stopped Republicans from launching a partisan attack. Join us now to take a look at the nomination, the process, and the opposition. We have two guests, CUNY professor and co-director of the Defenders Clinic, Nicole smith Futrell, and Judge Ashley Parker Dunstan. Welcome to both of you. Judge Dunstan, what do you make of the opposition to the pick? I'm not sure what the opposition would be, but I will say that um, as a black female um, and as a, as a member of the judiciary, um, I am just elated um, and excited for this opportunity um, for her. Um, and, and, you know, when you look at uh, who she is and you look at her background, I mean, you can clearly see that she is qualified no matter what her race, her gender, anything along those lines. She is overqualified for this position. And so um, I truly would love to see her in this place. I know uh, there are so many others like me that would love to see that, but she is an inspiration to myself and to all, I would say, to all women jurists. Mm -hmm. Nicole, what do you think about that? What's your reaction? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the opposition, I think it's politics, right? I think, you know, we're at a moment where, you know, Biden has affirmatively said that he wanted to make sure to see a black woman on this court. And there are a lot of people who want to take issue with that, right? That they feel like it's some sort of affirmative action to state that explicitly. But I think we're at a moment in our country where we've been dealing with a, a, racial, a racial reckoning for a number of years now, and it's been very prominent. 
that you know without folks taking deliberate steps to equalize the profession, equalize the judiciary, the composition of it, we're going to we're going to remain in the same place that we've been in for a really long time. So, you know, I think it's politics clearly Judge Jackson is extremely qualified, has uh, a very impressive resume, has worked in various aspects of the profession um, that make her incredibly well suited to sit on the bench, to sit on the Supreme Court. And so any opposition is clearly just political maneuvering. Yeah, one of the things that I noticed about all of this is that um, conveniently, those detractors seem to not remember the fact that for the majority of time, the majority of the justices have been white males. They don't mention that at all. Absolutely. I think it's something like, you know, of the 115 judges that have been on the Supreme Court, there have been two black people, you know, five that have been women. And so that's, you know, those numbers have to change. And without a deliberate re uh, reference to that and acknowledgement of that, it is not going to change. There are a lot of people of all racial backgrounds, all gender, all kind of backgrounds in this country that are really well qualified to be on the court, that have the legal acumen, that have the temperament. And Judge Jackson is clearly really well suited for this position. Mm -hmm. Judge Johnson, um, one of the things Republicans have taken issue with here is the fact that uh, she represented some clients uh, as a public defender. Now, Biden says he wants some public defenders on the bench at this point, but they're taking issue with that and questioning how she represented them, who she represented. Talk to me about that just a little bit. Well, you know, overall in the administration of justice, we want to ensure that all individuals are offered um, equal access to justice. And our jobs as, um, you know, as judges and jurists is to ensure that that happens. But it's also um, the job of public defenders and district attorneys all across uh, the country to ensure that every individual that comes into that courtroom is treated fairly um, and their constitutional rights um, are preserved. Um, so I think it is challenging at any time to um, condemn anyone for being a prosecutor or being a public defender and, you know, being a public servant to ensure that our justice system runs blindly and smoothly as it's supposed to, um, you know, I, I hope that that would not be something that um, would be used against her. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Nicole? Yeah, I mean, it, it hits me very personally. I started my career as a public defender uh, at, the, at the Bronx Defenders in the Bronx. And, you know, it's really important to have the perspective of representing people who are directly impacted by our legal system. And so I, I think it gives um, just a, a perspective and an approach that we really haven't seen on the bench in, in some time. Most of the folks who are appointed to serve in judicial positions uh, come from, you know, prosecutorial or other sort of big firm kind of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, Judge Jackson kind of has it all, which is really nice. And I think she'll bring, you know, that depth of experience of having really worked closely with folks who are the other side of the law, who, you know, who are entitled to that representation. Um, she'll bring that perspective into her decisions as she already has. And I think that's been missing, you know, from the court for a long time. And I think President Biden's aware of that. Judge Johnson, I wonder if you could talk to us just a little bit about some of the challenges you have faced as a jurist. Definitely. Um, I am here in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you all today. Um, but I am in the capital county um, and city of North Carolina. And I am only the third and I am the youngest black female that has ever served in this position since the courts were established over 50 years ago. Um, I was appointed in 2017 um, by our governor and have won an election since then. But I can tell you that it was absolutely challenging um, for me to pursue this goal. I was told that I was unqualified. I was told I was inexperienced. Um, and a lot of those things really came from my race, came from my gender, and came from uh, my age. And so I can tell you that the things that I'm seeing and the things that we are seeing happen to Judge Jackson at this point are similar things that other black female jurists um, in pursuing the bench have also suffered. Um, and so I hope that this will change and that we will encourage uh, black female judges um, who have a heart and a compassion uh, for the communities that we're serving um, to ensure that we have equity and that we have uh, racial diversity um, in every aspect of the system. Nicole, how much of this is really actually about bringing that different perspective to the bench? I think it's a big part of it, you know, and I, I think, you know, we for too long have had just sort of one orientation. And you can also look and see the background of folks. You know, Judge, 
Jackson has a very prestigious back. She's gone to Harvard for undergrad, for law school. But, you know, a lot of the folks who have been serving on the bench come from that very elite sort of perspective, right? Or Ivy League, right? Or Ivy League, right? And so she brings that, true, but she also brings the experience of having, you know, she speaks about having had relatives who were impacted by the criminal legal system, you know, who have been incarcerated for long periods of time. Um, she's talked about having, on the other side of that, relatives who have worked in law enforcement and who have served in the, in the armed forces. And so I think, you know, we have to think about that breadth of experience that people bring, that lived experience, that will really influence how they think about decisions on the court. And, you know, further about her, she also, you know, has served as a district court judge. Um, she served as a public defender. And I think every aspect of that experience, you know, is really meaningful and valuable on the court and, and will approach, it will, it will change how people approach decisions, how she approaches decisions, and bring a more human aspect to um, the decisions that come out of the court. I want to hear from both of you on this point. Um, at this juncture, what would you say to those detractors who are trying to uh, tear her down? <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. I don't know if I'd say anything directly to them. I, w I guess what I would really focus on is looking back at where we have been, right? And if folks think that it is, you know, appropriate, it is fitting that we have had a judiciary and a legal profession that has been so overwhelmingly white, has been so overwhelmingly male, and if uh, how they think we're going to change that unless we take proactive steps and bring in folks who have a more diverse background, whether it be racial, gender, profession wise. Uh, to, to bring to bear on the court. And so, you know, for those detractors, I think they're just doing their jobs. Like, that's, that's what they're going to do, right? But um, I, I think it's undeniable that we have had a court and a legal profession that is skewed one way for too long. And I would, I would ask those folks what they recommend or if they have any interest at all in seeing that change. The answer might be no. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Dustin, how about you? What, what would you say to the detractors here? I mean, the same thing that Professor Futrell said, you know, at the end of the day, we need to be aware and cognizant of the fact that there's nothing affirmative action about this whatsoever. She is qualified, period. Um, and that is the thing. And so I, I just hope that she's able to um, to hold her head up. She's done this before. She can do it again. Um, he is the best person for this position. And I hope that anybody would be able to see that um, and to not focus on the detractors, but focus on her calling and focus on um, her ability to perform this um, this job. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I'm struck by is the fact that it's not as if she's replacing a conservative justice right. here. She would be replacing a retiring justice. It's not going to change the court. Exactly. There really isn't much that's going to shift in terms of the ideological perspective of the Supreme Court balance. And so, you know, I think uh, for, for many Republicans, maybe looking ahead to the midterms, right, and thinking about, you know, what is the narrative that they're going to kind of bring out and project, especially around you know, because she's got this experience having worked as a public defender with the Sentencing Commission, you know, how does she feel about the criminal legal system? Is she soft on crime? You know, she's represented folks who, you know, uh, were on Guantanamo before. And what does that mean? So I think it's not so much perhaps about her, but maybe more about the larger narrative that they're trying to make about Democrats and about, you know, where we are right now with the with crime and the criminal legal system. Yeah, they're certainly playing up the soft on crime aspect of that. I, I believe so. But I think the main thing is remember that jurists are supposed to be fair and impartial. That's what we've been called to do. Um, she's been doing this job for several years, has been doing a great job at it, obviously. Um, and so, you know, we really have to get the politics out of the bench um, to ensure that when we talk about equity, it is about um, ensuring that people are treated fairly. Yeah, that's going to be a tough thing to do, though, to get the politics out of the bench. Considering all the things that have happened over the last four years, I mean, we had Mitch McConnell denying Barack Obama that Supreme Court pick. That put us in a, a world of trouble as far as the court is concerned. Yeah, I think yeah. that definitely has, you know, set the tone for how these proceedings yeah. have been going for the last few years. I think, you know, Kavanaugh, even the way, you know, the um, appointment came about after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. And so it's a very, you know, these these processes are very tense. Um, they have a lot at stake. And I think, you know, folks are always sort of maneuvering and trying to, you know, make sure that they stake their position. And so we're, you know, it's going to be a bruising process no matter what, even though, as we say, it's not going to really change the ideological balance that's on the bench right now. Okay, well, a very historical and important nomination and confirmation process. Thanks to our guests, CUNY professor and co-director of the Defenders Clinic, Nicole smith Futrell, and Judge Ashley Parker Dunstan. Thank you to both of you. We're going to take a short break and then some final thoughts. I'm Mike Gilliam, and this is Let It Rip. 
You're watching CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome back to Let It Rip. I'm Mike Gilliam. Now for some final thoughts. The war in Ukraine is terrible and unprovoked. Innocent people are losing their lives and homes. But in the midst of this tragedy, race has once again become a huge issue. For African students and others trying to leave Ukraine and escape the constant firing of artillery shells and bombing of cities, to be stopped from trying to leave like everyone else because of the color of their skin is unacceptable, and it speaks to a larger problem globally. Here at home, one cannot honestly deny that race is playing a role in the Supreme Court nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. She was confirmed for the Court of Appeals, but now there are questions about her sitting on the Supreme Court bench. There was backlash over President Biden saying he would nominate an African-American woman to the high court while campaigning, with some saying that the pick should be based on merits and not on race. But that argument conveniently overlooks the fact that the vast majority of justices have always been white males. Some say we look at everything through the lens of racism, and that's wrong. I would say if we don't look at the obvious, then we'll never fix these problems. And there are a lot of them. I'm Mike Gilliam. We'll see you next time on Let It Rip.